that happened last night. And last night we had an incredible viewing of an original slideshow of Alagus Trukhanis' work from the 70s, Rob, mainly. And that was a body of work taken exclusively of Lake Pedder. And Lake Pedder was a campaign that was happening before the Franklin campaign. And it was probably helped form the backbone of, of the kind of people and organizations and ethos that, that then moved into the more successful Franklin campaign. And so Bob Brown, who's one of the great leaders, leaders of conservation in this part of the world, was kind of operating running the show and Alagus's wife was was very generously offering us the capacity to see her work and Nick and uh, Luke and myself really wanted to be a part of that uh, to support what it was and also to get access to the work because it wasn't recorded it was just live and that was it so we uh, I personally found it a bit of a <laughs> bit of a religious experience <laughs> almost uh, in terms of imagining you know it going around Australia with thousands of people sort of being moved to tears by what it represented and and the movement that it was stirring up and beginning in, in, in the country and beyond in terms of the use of, of imagery for the power of conservation. And Rob will know a bit more about what, what came after that because uh, he was engaged with, with some of the Franklin based campaign afterwards, but that was a great precedent for, I guess, all that kind of work and, and the power of imagery that was certainly probably in my life, some of the earliest exposure I had to the significance of, of the use of imagery in, in, in conservation and, and the very successful empowering use of it. Um, pretty incredible man in, in lineage in, in Tasmania around that. And tonight we have Mr. Blakers, who in my mind and many minds is, is probably the living epitome of, of what that lineage is, is, is running on in, in Tasmania in particular. You know, Rob's dedicated huge part of his, his life to, to um, the conservation of, of high conservation area places all, all the way around Tasmania. And oh, you, can, you can talk to me, Rob, about other places in the world, but I'm more familiar with, with your role down here. And I've sort of interwoven some of my own journey with bouncing around Rob's in terms of being involved in some of the organizations that we've um, collectively engaged with to, to have our imagery used for higher purpose. But but Rob's, the depth of Rob's legacy is, is well beyond any of ours uh, and most people I know on the planet, not just individuals or, or um, photographers. So, um, so yeah, so, we, so we've got a few videos from, from Luke and, and myself uh, and the Light Collector's role in, uh, as well, but Rob's definitely the showcase, but we thought we might um, introduce the evening with a, with a beautiful video that Luke put together a few years ago, just to set the scene for the kind of conversation we're going to be moving into tonight. Thanks very much, Paul. And I um, also wanted to credit um, uh, Ben Coop from Leap, Leap Films, who um, who really put it to all together. I just um, did all the walking around, but um, here we go. Can't see you, Loki. Not playing. Uh, it's not cut up on my screen. I can hear the music in the background. Okay, we'll try it again. Sorry about that, everybody. Um, there we go. As landscape photographers, we have an intrinsic relationship with the environment. It sort of naturally comes from that, that you want to help protect it because that's the very thing you photograph. If it wasn't protected, then you wouldn't have anything to shoot anymore. And you see how beautiful these places are. You don't want them to end up being trashed. is to try and help other people see that beauty and really feel it so that if there is a threat there they're outraged as they should be but they don't know 
If they don't know about it, then how can they be outraged? And so that's the challenge, actually getting people to feel that. Um, sorry about the technical problems there i haven't seen that until today so um just a proviso everyone uh vimeo is quite notoriously not particularly forgiving with, with video and it does depend a little bit on on your um your streaming capacity at the other end but um we've done a few tests and we and we figured it's it's enough at least to engage the conversation and, and get us thinking um as opposed to um us photographers that want everything visually perfect all the time yeah. uh it's as much about the message tonight as as anything um so i don't know who wants to introduce rob or do we want a general conversation first about what we feel uh, we want to introduce the show with or what do you think i'm happy to leap in and say a couple of things just to um place the perspective from my side and it's sort of in the context of this period that we're in which is a bit, you know, obviously unprecedented and unusual. And it's also um, been a distraction from, you know, what immediately preceded the pandemic was the bushfires and all the other elements of climate change, all of the other issues that we've been dealing with, you know, forever. And we've sort of been put into this space where we're doing much more domestic. Many of us, most of us are probably, you know, doing much more domestic stuff from around home and just sort of staying at home a lot more rather than, um, and you know, being engaged and engrossed in what's happening in terms of the pandemic. Um, but at least in Tassie, we are definitely moving out of that phase, and it's uh, a process of re-engaging. Um, and it's not that pleasant necessarily re-engaging with you know what's actually happening in the world. And what Luke's video was highlighting is um, brought to mind for me a couple of questions and the first is you know what is what is the state of the world and then i think the answer to that in terms of environmental and not only environmental issues uh, is pretty clear like there's a lot of um things which shouldn't be happening and then the the, the second question that arises then and i know it's for me and i think it's for most people is you know given climate crises given you know, all of the other issues, human, animal, social, economic, whatever, what can I do? And given the escalating um, nature of these crises and given the escalating na nature of the consequences and the fact that, you know, climate change in particular compounds everything um, and tipping points are reached and ecosystems start to collapse. I mean, all of this is happening and we've been sort of been able to forget it over the last month or two through the pandemic, but it's been you know, grinding on while we've been at home. And so then it comes back to that question that I said before, and it, it's one that like I sort of engage with on a daily basis, what can I do? And I think that's, um, you know, where we, that's how, what I find interesting because we all, you know, to greater or lesser degree would feel that, would, would have that, question and how do we respond to it you know we've all got different 
skills, history, relationships, contacts, capacity, materially and otherwise, to do different things. We're all, you know, completely unique people. Um, but there's all, for all of us, I think there's something that we can do um, that pushes, nudges the planet and, you know, the humans and the animals that live on this planet, you know, better direction rather than, you know, towards the, you know, less than ideal destination that we're heading for. So Rob, where do you see the role of, of image making in that regard? And I'd love to hear a little bit more about your your journey into that discovery of its power, kind of who who and how did you sort of engage yourself in, in recognizing that you as an individual and and as an as an artist, as a photographer, had the capacity to to influence, you know, the conservation and and how you know, you developed and started understanding the significance of, of photography in, 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 that, in that light? Sort of a couple of answers. One, externally, like as you alluded to before, like I grew up in Canberra and came down here for a three week cross country skiing holiday in 1980 and there was no snow. So I wandered into the Wilderness Society offices and that was just a year or two before the Franklin River blockade. And so I got drawn into that and that turned my whole life around. Um, I was incredibly inept, um, had no skills, no understanding, very naive. Um, and so dealing, you know, working alongside the, the other people in the Wilderness Society offices leading up to the blockade was extraordinary. Um, just the education that I got and the shifting of my, um, you know, direction. But I guess I was there to be shifted. Um, you know, it's not an accident that one does these things. And I think that, you know, to all, all of us, to a greater or lesser degree, or, and in different ways, are drawn to be, you know, to try and do positive, good things, not um, out of a goody-goody sort of sense, but rather that, you know, this is the thing before us. This is the position I'm in. Let me just take the next step. Let, let me move. You know, I can continue on doing something which isn't particularly useful, or I can this thing is, you know, in front of me, let me take the step into, you know, one step into to doing what I can to, to help that. And then obviously, you know, through the Franklin, Franklin campaign, Peter Dom was um, producing extraordinary image, imagery, which um, was hugely instrumental in the final outcome. So it's sort of, you know, a very, practical demonstration of what I could see in the power of imagery there and also just an internal feeling that this is the direction I'm headed and it wasn't even a conscious one particularly and again we're all different for me it wasn't a conscious uh feeling that yes I'm going to go and do this this and this it was more just it was of interest it was a great interest and in the years since that I've always found photographing like I love going to national parks um and photographing within them but it gives a whole another layer of a purpose to go to areas that need protection or need imagery of for whatever reason um, and so then you've got the two things one you know the joy of photography and the the challenge and the creativity of photography but if you get a cracker image or a cracker bit of video it can be used and it can be used for a good purpose and so the, the two things go hand in hand So where did that sort of become a, a reality where, it, you know, you started realizing that was going to become more of your career? Is there, was there any few significant moments where you're like, you know, because how long have you been sh shooting now? Like 35, 40 years you've been sort of engaged with, you know, conservation based landscape based imagery. And I mean, I, I, I sort of getting it, didn't get a chance to introduce you like I wanted to Rob in terms of people that might not be aware, but Rob's been shooting for a very long time and he's produced a number of books and a huge amount of publications and calendars and, and different sort of aspects for different organizations, particularly conservation-based organizations as well, not just here, all around Australia and some places around the world. And, you know, like if, if Nick and Luke and I look up to the kind of person that we feel is, is, is really flying the flag for what's possible and is so genuinely and honestly and authentically engaged with the principles behind it as well. And Rob sort of holds a bit of a shining light to all of us really. And so, you know, Rob's knowledge of a lot of things like the, the subtlety of the issues involved in conservation, the politics, the government, the economics, 
as well as his intricate knowledge of the actual flora and fauna and, and their historical and, and bio, not biological, um, you know what I mean, their importance ecologically. Um, like he just, Rob, to me, just have this, this incredible sort of overlying capacity to understand a lot of the broader issues involved, not just sort of the one, the obvious ones down the middle. And, and it's your sort of critical knowledge in a lot of those areas that I, I personally sort of really look up to and, and take it, take sort of lead from. Um, and I guess that's, that's one of the ways to approach it. It's like, you know, if the more awareness and knowledge that you have of the wider issues and the intricacies of what, what's engaged, the more you can apply yourself as an image maker to what those are. And, and one of the things I noticed about Rob in the last few years is just some obvious places like, have you been there? Oh, no. Well, are you going to go there? Well, not really. And I was like, why is that? Well, it doesn't really need protecting. It's already protected. <laughs> I need to put my energy and focus in the places that really need it. And, you know, and I've seen pictures of Rob's that are like, well, this tree was, you know, on the back of, um, you know, one kilometer from this mining platform on some ridge that I've never heard of and wouldn't have a clue how to get to. And Rob's stomping around there for weeks and places that no one's ever even heard of or even knows exist in some ways because he's done the homework and the research and has the understanding of the particular um, direct threats that, that are happening. Um, and he's the one who knows how to get in there and where to go and how to read, navigate all the maps and, and structures around the different industries and primary industries that, that are engaged with, you know, seeing that as purely as an economic resource rather than a, a cultural and ecological one. Um, it goes back to what you said, Luke, in that video, that when you are in a place, when you engage with the place, you know, you, you begin, you know, you love that place. And I remember there's this organization called Nature Photographers Tasmania, and it's not very active now, but it's, it's been a good networking tool for a number of years, but it's, um, when we started. That's how up, I first met you, Rob, I think, pretty yeah, sure. Yeah, when we started it up, um, we had a number of projects that we engaged quite, you know, actively and politically and directly with. Um, and one of them was logging in the Florentine Valley. And we had about 30 or so, you know, active photographers, active photographers. I think the criteria for being uh, within the within Nature Photographers Tasmania had to be active and you had to be, you know, at some level professional. And so we had a, you know, a good bunch of, of people and essentially everyone who was publishing it all in, in Tassie and, and more widely than that as well. And so we, um, you know, invited it, you know, wrote a pretty direct letter um, opposing the logging of the Florentine and, and just sent it around to check that everyone was happy to sign it. And everyone, you know, of all the actively working professional photographers in Tasmania, there was just one or two who, who, who said, oh, no, this is not for me. Um, and all the rest, it was just instant yes. I mean, because of engagement with place, engagement, not even with necessarily the Florentine, but just knowing the quality of these landscapes, the value of these landscapes, and um, the fact that it's ignorance and not engagement, um, non understanding of these places that allows, and you know, and obviously, you know, there might be some valid reasons, but there's also you know money making um, reasons as well. But it's primarily the, divor the being divorced from these places that allows them to be uh, inappropriately used. So sort of awareness, I guess, Robin, and relate, yeah. try to build a relationship with a place you don't know exists um, and, and haven't engaged with yourself. Um, Except as, I mean, probably most of the people listening, but not necessarily, not necessarily everyone is, you know, a photographer of some description. And whether it's photography or painting or writing or whatever, when you do engage with, with country, with landscape, with place, that can be transposed to other places. Like I spent some time in the US 15 years ago and instant like the US is a gorgeous, you know, has a lot of gorgeous landscapes, but having spent, you know, a lot of time in Australian and Tasmanian landscapes, it was very easy to appreciate the US places, even though they're completely different flora, fauna, landforms, etc. But it's this, you know, inherent nature, natural quality that you instantly relate to. Um, even and so many places I can still relate to, like I've never been down the Franklin, I don't suspect I ever will, I don't expect ever to go there, but it doesn't matter. Um, you know, I, I can see from, you know, you can see very easily and quickly that the caliber of the place is such that it should be protected, it's fantastic, but you know, one doesn't have to go to every single place to understand its value. 
Yeah, but I, I mean, I think photography serves a tool to create a link to that for people that are never going to go there or that don't know it exists. And I think what I've learned, I guess myself is, is conserving a place is a lot about building a community, communal relationship to it. Um, and I think, you know, you'd, you'd know more than me with, with, you know, seeing some of the living examples, some of the great photographers in the world doing what they can to create that thread that just joins the dots, I guess. Um, and I don't know, like how, I wonder sometimes how you've kept that fire burning for so long, you know, in the face of loss or in the face of, you know, lack of success, I guess, or, or reaching goals or, or, you know, the economic powers that be overriding, you know, the ecological and biodiversity sort of issues and so on. Like, how do you, how do you sort of keep that faith and inspiration, Rob, in the face of, uh, you know, so much challenge, I guess. I mean, you love these places. And by extension, you know, that takes you to, you know, not just only loving the Florentine or the Franklin River or whatever, you know, that extends more broadly. And again, going back to your earlier sort of thought and comment, um, you know, one is motivated to, you know, look at maps and keep, you know, engage politically um, because of love and grief, both, both things. Um, and again, in, in this era, I remember I gave a talk, it was only about three years ago at Wild Island, um, and it was, in, I think it was after the 2016 fires, so that's four years ago. Um, and so I was talking about the fires, and I went back to my speech after the 2019 fires and reread it, and what was astounding to me is that in that 2016 talk, I'd said, I'd alluded to this sense that I felt, and I felt that many of us shared that and, and at, at an unconscious level, that all of the things that people have done to this planet um, may come home to bite us, you know, the chickens may come home to roost. And there was just the hint of it, and that's a mere four years ago. And this, this is, um, you know, very, you know, it's profoundly disturbing because that I should uh, think of the, the fear that we might be um, you know, fundamentally and profoundly ups, uh, upsetting, you know, the, the natural cycles of the planet, that I should couch that as an unconscious thought just four years ago, whereas now it's so front and centre of all of our minds in a very conscious way, and that has changed so quickly. You know, what's it going to be like in another four years, another 10 years? You know, things are shifting really, really quickly. And I think there's that urgency, um, and that's what drives me. Um, I think as, as an aside, as photographers, we sort of do get a bit of a, a free ride in that, although we engage with the negative aspects of, of damage and so on, clear fills or whatever, we also spend a fair bit of time looking at the positive, the beautiful, and that, you know, and we love, because we love that, that country, that, that beauty, um, you know, the inherent qualities of nature. That, that is a real driver as well. And the other side of, of that question, you know, how do you keep motivated is, you know, Bob Brown said it 10, 20 years ago. Um, you know, it's not necessarily always easy and it's, not, it's absolutely not always going to bring success, <laughs> but the alternative is awful. Um, and I think that, you know, the alternative of doing nothing, you'll be guaranteed that, you know, we'll lose everything and I think as people will also be miserable. Um, I think I would be totally depressed if I didn't have an avenue to try and nudge the planet in a better direction. And I think that's, it's empowering, it's enjoyable. You end up work, working with fantastic people, like from coming down and being engaged with the Franklin, the people I was working with were all, you know, altruistic, young, idealistic, active, intelligent, hardworking, dedicated people. I mean, what a bunch of, of people to be working with and to learn from. And that's ongoing, like it's, it continues. People who care and who put themselves out there to do what they can, great or small, you know, whatever it is. Um, that's a lovely way to be with people. You, um, 
you have to be pretty patient, don't you, Rob? Um, some of these things take a long time to achieve, and there's sort of an a sort of notice. It, it's always there's always a push towards the positive outcomes, and it always seems to be climbing positively. And then you get a setback, and you know you, you drop off again, and then you sort of pick yourselves up and and, and keep pushing towards that positive. And everything seems to go in that positive direction eventually. I'm, I'm thinking about some really hard-fought battles over the years for you know, the Florentine, um, of, of which um, some of it's now uh, protected as World Heritage and sticks as well, and, and places um, uh, like the Great Western Tears and, and those more recent extensions. And then, and thinking back to the you know the, the extensions um, in the uh, late eighties and, and and whatnot, uh, and and now I suppose uh, you know there's there's always more to, to um, push for, and and the, and the tark on is that at the moment sort of the the, the big push, but I, I I always get the sense that it's going to succeed. We're going to get somewhere if we keep showing people what these places have, what they are, what they mean to us, what they mean to uh, the Aboriginal people, what they mean to uh, people that don't even know what they mean, what it means to them yet. But if we show them what, what is there, we, we can build that, that, that little bit of positivity and it keeps coming and coming and coming and, and it, it's like a wave, it just builds and builds. And I think that's probably one of the one of the, the, the great positives, a bit of patience and we will get there. We can't ever, like we, we, you know, create tactics and strategies to try and achieve, you know, what we see as desirable in terms of nature conservation, but we can never be assured of the goal. We don't, um, the outcome is not ours to command. We can do absolutely everything at every level to achieve what we think is a good outcome, but you know, it may come, it may not come. Um, and so you can't be too outcomes focused um, because you'll be inevitably disappointed and the waiting will be too long. You know, if you're battling for years and decades for a certain outcome and you either lose it or it just takes you know, forever, then that's not sustainable. So wow. you've just got to you know, have the sense, you know, one is doing the right thing and just move ahead in absolutely the most creative, intelligent, smart, innovative, intuitive way that you possibly can to achieve that. Um, yeah. And, and I guess not all of us are um, able to commit our entire lives to conservation. Um, I know I'm, I'm one of those. I do what I can when I can, but um, circumstances mean that I, I just can't um, being involved in everything uh, and, and obviously Rob you're, you're more in the other boat where you you have committed your um, your life really to to these these goals uh, but I think it is important to to tell you know the audience out there that, that it's small things um, that help it's it's sharing that beautiful image of your local area that, that may or even may not be under threat but sharing those images to people that that wouldn't otherwise um, know are there or, or ordinarily wish to visit. And it's that, that little chipping away that, that changes attitudes over time. And, and you know, I take, I take solace with, with what I do, that, that there are people that, that enjoy my work and, they, and, and I get the feedback pretty regularly. Thank you so much for showing me something that I'll never, ever get to see for myself. And, and I feel I'm, I'm changing attitudes and I think we, we can all do that no matter what our situation is. We can just push, you know, a little in, in that direction, just so it shows, you know, even if it's, you know, you know a, a little orchid that's down at your local reserve um, um, through to the sleeping landscapes of um, Takana or, 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 or whatever, but, but just that, that chipping away and, and, and even that is just enough. And I think that's, that's part of the power of, photography and conservation, just the, the small contributions and then people such as yourself, Rob, that, that really that push the, you know, the, big, the, the big issues in the right direction as well. Yeah, I mean, I think in Tassie, 
well, I mean, there's always been plenty of issues in Tassie, but now there's, you know, the very big obvious one in terms of land that deserves protection, and that's Tarkine. So as you were saying, every picture or every trip to Tarkine, whether one takes a picture or not, you know, if one talks to you know, one's family or neighbours, or if you do take a picture, you share it on Facebook or, or whatever. Um, it's all building the identity of the Tarkine as an extraordinary place, which is, you know, worthy of World Heritage Protection. But there's a, you know, a zillion other issues, be they relating to the natural world or, you know, society or whatever, that all can, you know, benefit from our input. There's also been a, a question as well uh, from Dan Brune, or I guess more of a, a thought starter in relation to the discussion uh, about sharing places with people and um, when they see these places, then they're going to want to protect it because they can see how beautiful it is. And um, sort of the, the view that, you know, that's been a well-trodden sort of line for a long time. And is there a, 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 a better way or a, a newer way that um, the, that message can still be um, put forward, I suppose? I mean, I think we live, you know, just looking at a purely technological time, technological uh, level we live in extraordinary time as photographers because technology is changing and improving so quickly like 20 years ago you know i'd moved from 35 mil to medium format then eventually had a five by four camera which i just loved and then the digital era came along and i was slow to jump from the four by five back to a little digital 35 mil um but you know hopped on board a few years later and then the pace of change has accelerated since then. I've sort of surprised myself because I've ended up um, being, you know, purchasing new equipment much more than I anticipated I would have. And the reason is that sadly, the incremental changes make a big difference in what we can do. Like, of you know, over the last few years, um, you know, technology has improved so much and you know it's on this exponential increase of improvement and so you can now convey you can now represent your subject matter be it nature or whatever and particularly nature you can represent it so much better than we ever could even 510 let alone you know 50 years ago when lagos was 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 working um and the other thing to add to that is that not only do, do we have you know the technology to produce um stills, still images, um, you know, which, which are better than ever before, but also video um, technology is, you know, in terms of capturing video has increased incredibly um, in terms of quality and also the platforms, the way you can present video has just opened up. Like again, even 20, 10, 20 years ago, if you wanted to make some sort of short film, even like what you just showed there, Luke, where's it going to be shown? You know, a little short before a a major film at a cinema, sure, but it's going to have to be a much more grand um, production to, to make that. Whereas now, video can be shared as readily as stills online, and because it's uh, you know arguably more potent in being able to carry convey a message, um, it's probably you know a stronger storyteller than than stills are. Stills can be, you know, printed and shown in exhibitions, in books, and so on. But, you know, does that balance out the extra power that video has in being able to tell a story, being able to, you know, bring people to narrate a story? Um, yeah. So, I, I mean, one thing I was reflecting leading up to tonight is that, you know, personally, I found falling into video just. Uh, a huge learning curve, but very exciting, uh, rewarding. And, you know, it's all just, it's there to be explored. And I just encourage every stills photographer, you know, most, well, probably every video or every um, digital stills camera has got a video capacity. You know, go out and play with video. Um, it also gives us another, like if you go out bush, it gives us another, um, thing to be doing because you can't always be taking stills the light isn't necessarily good enough at certain times to um, you know to be an optimum time for taking stills but there's often times when light's suboptimal for stills but there's a fantastic scope uh, or subject for, for video and it's, it's probably a, 
not a bad segue perhaps to show one of your um films that you have there um sure rob give me a second i'll try not to yeah i remember uh not that long ago i um i was coming back uh from a trip out to the tarkine coast or was i heading down there and i saw this in the distance i saw this orange thing just waving in the distance in a, in a rain squall and i was thinking geez i wonder who that is and i was like and the captain's like ah oh, we can't go pick him up it's, it's too dangerous the water's too rough and i was saying to the captain like no he's probably out of food and, and there's nothing there and he's he doesn't know there's no communications you know what's going to happen oh i can't do it i can't do it so then i kept pushing kept pushing and i ended up uh, convincing the captain to go and pick this poor person up and it was rob <laughs> <laughs> uh, coming back from i don't know how many days out on the coast on his own and he had the biggest backpack i've ever seen in human existence and inside his backpack was an inspired drone and i think 18 batteries did you say rob uh or something ridiculous and and it just uh and it was kind of my insight into into rob's transition and that he was really embracing the video realm and and drone footage in particular is something that Rob's really um, launched in on. He's done aerial work for a long time, but that's something where I sort of started to become more aware of, of Rob's kind of sneaky transition as in like, I hadn't seen the results yet, but I saw the man working in his element and, and really um, engaging in, in, a, in a really modern and, and new and potentially innovative way to engage with landscape and to share it. And one of the great uh, capacities of drone that I don't think, many people can argue with is its video capacity is incredible and its capacity to share and expose places that you'd never otherwise see with with uh in in the past is, is quite amazing yeah i owe you thank you paul for rescuing me because i would have been gnashing my teeth sitting there with no food for another day or two before he came back to pick me up um so i what, about three four years ago um i had an idea to um, do a project on conservation. A couple of themes I was looking at. One was a, a, a video on the Tarkine, one was a video on rainforests, and one was a video just on areas that need protection more broadly, not just the Tarkine. And so I approached parks because flying drones, you can't just go off and do it in a park for good reasons. They're terribly annoying, they impact wildlife, um, et cetera, et cetera. Um, so I approached parks and you know, put these proposals to them and the initial response was, oh no, you can't fly a drone in a, in a national park. And then I explained further and somehow he was able to be convinced. Um, and so I did get you no know, permit for specific flying at specific times. And so I've sort of taken advantage of that um, for both the Tarkine project and then a second project that I'm still currently working on is uh, one on the Tasmanian Gondwana. So all the paleoendemic, the ancient paleoendemic species, the Fagus, the Kimberley Pines, the Pencil Pines, the Hewan Pines, which are terribly threatened in Tasmania by fire, not so much, you know, deliberate human impacts or logging or whatever. It's more just climate change induced escalating fire risk for these places. Um, so when I bumped into Paul there on the Pyman River, it was yeah, coming back from a, a trip to document some um, the some, some areas in the Tarkine. And so there's a a video here which I'll try and work now. I'll go share screen. Put you on the spot there, Rob. No, it's a good segue. Bring it across. Does that look okay? Yeah, it looks great. Okay. Yep.
Well, the crowd goes wild. Yeah! <laughs> <laughs> now, Robert, I'm aware that some of the audience isn't from Tasmania or around Australia, and they might know, might not know a lot about the Tarkana and the significance of it. Do you do you want to maybe paint that picture with a with a, a more colourful brush? Um, you know, I think that you know we we sort of here on a photography thought forum, and I think that pictures you know tell a thousand words. Uh, you know, it's 365,000 hectares um, in the northwest of Tasmania. It's got Australia's biggest rainforest. It's got a wild, untracked coast, well, a wild coastline anyway, um, and separating the coastline and the rainforest is uh, a series of, of mountain ranges, not particularly high, but, you know, wild and, and beautiful. Um, you know, it's, it's not pristine in every... Um, part of it, but the fact that it has Australia's biggest rainforest wilderness, the fact that it's got this extraordinary coastline, um, you know, those two, they're the, probably the two strongest and the main um, value, natural values of the place. And then all of the, the flora fauna that those habitats support, um, you know, to my mind, it's absolutely, you know, it's a no brainer. It's a world heritage uh, stature place. Um, so Rob, was it, wasn't it actually listed as such at some stage, Rob? And no, looking, it's never been. In that direction, or was it? No, I mean, that, the extra, I mean, it's just, it's, it's farcical, the situation, the status quo, because um, the Savage River National Park is a landlocked area without any road access um, in the middle of the rainforest, and that's all very good, but it's only 4% of the Tarkine area. Another 4% um, of the Tarkine is stripped down the coast, was listed um, on the map, on the, the, what is it? The Natural Heritage Register. So even if, but even that doesn't preclude safe four-wheel drive access down the coast, which is the main threat, not only to the natural values, but to the extraordinary cultural values. Like Aboriginal people lived on that coast for tens of thousands of years, and you can feel it. Like when you walk up that coast, it's just every glance. It's, it's like a walking museum. You know, Rob. Sorry. It's like a walking museum going. It up is. It's extraordinary. There are so many myths and so many stone tools on um, the hut depressions, scatters, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And it's you know it's it's so recent that the Aboriginal people were, were taken from that land, like less than two hundred years, um, and it's like they left yesterday because the evidence of them being there is so strong. Um, and yeah, so I mean the, the threat to that area is uh, four wheel drive use um, because four wheel drives have an impact, sadly. Um, uh, where was I going with that? Um, yeah, so the, the, nat the National Heritage Protection doesn't preclude that use. So even if we count that, you know, maximum of 8% of the Tarkine is, is protected in some form, but all the rest is not. All the rest is open for uh, rainforest logging, including, you know, big eucalypts and mining, and mining leases cover approximately 50% of the Tarkine. Um, you know, so it's, as I said, a farcical situation because it's just such a ludicrous status quo. Um, whereas the area as a whole is, is so fantastic and worth so much more than, you know, picking the bits out of it for short term material gain. So for anyone who wants to know a little bit more about the, um, the cultural and the, the First Nations people's relationship with the land, Rob and I were actually invited to be part of a a project where they created a book called Takaina Country Culture Spirit. And they engaged a lot of the living, the kind of members of the community that, that have a, have their own living, long running relationship with that country. And they've been given uh, a, a really strong voice to, to advocate what that country means to them. And there's been quite an ongoing debate on that particular strip of coastline around four drive access to, you know, for maybe one or two generations of people that, they like to use it recreationally, but if you go down that coastline, you know, the most obvious path to take to get your, uh, your, your four drive over the dunes is right through the middle of the middens because they give you the most grip for your car. So it's kind of like, where is the right of, you know, one or two generations of people to, you know, a thousand generations of history? Where, where do we find that balance of, of respect for both? And there's been certain injunctions and, and quite a bit of controversy around the, the land use in particular that coast but if you are interested in in learning a bit, a bit more about it and particularly the cultural relationship of uh, the living one um, from a community that 
worldwide, not many people know a lot about, you know, the Tasmania Aboriginal community was seen to be, if you ask a lot of people around the world, they, they will assume there isn't one. Oh, I thought they died out in 1900 and so and so. It's kind of like, it's a bit of a shock for people to know that's even a living, breathing community to some extent. So that's an example for me, Rob, of, of, of that multimedia approach of where, where you're in my and Matt's imagery and, and, and the spoken words of the community is a, is a great combined vehicle to, to educate, inspire and, and challenge people. Um, and I feel like one aspect of photography that I sort of Dan alluded to a little bit and, and I've been wanting, wanting to ask you about is, and it might be a segue into your, um, your um, expose on fire that we've got here tonight is where do we use beauty and where do we use kind of destruction or challenge in, in that conversation? You know, where, where is which most effective? You know, artists have used beauty for hundreds, if not thousands of years to, to build relationship with place and inspire protection and engagement with, with, with somewhere that people haven't necessarily been. And, and in the conservation campaigns you've been a part of, you know, the destructive side and making people aware of the consequences of, of a lot of the economic decisions that people wouldn't know about because it's all hidden away uh, are made available for people to make decisions around. Um, how do you find that sort of dance? And and I think maybe at the end of that conversation, it might be worth looking at how your images on the impact of fire might speak to that. Yeah, I mean, I think, I think no, no. Sorry, Nick, or something? No, there's no single answer to that. Um, we're all different. Like for me, beauty is, you know, that's what draws me and holds me and that's what I love and that's what motivates me. Um, at the same time, showing uh, inappropriate, brutal um, treatment of, and it's not just physical beauty, but intrinsic uh, value, intrinsic subtlety, intrinsic um, like time embodied in a rainforest or time embodied in you know, 2000 year old trees or whatever. And if we let the rainforest be logged or let it be do things that, that facilitate it burning or more, being more, more likely to burn and a, a 2000 year old tree, if we you know, allow the same course of events to happen so that we lose these, this extraordinary, uh, not only beautiful, but just intrinsically valuable heritage of this, 2,000 year old trees within a forest which has been unburnt for 10,000 years. Um, if we, as you know, the custodians of this planet, allow that to happen, you know, what an indictment on us, what a terrible indictment on us. So the tools that we can use, I think it's really important to, you know, obviously, you know, all of us here are interested in photography, or most of us at least are interested in photography. Um, it's an incredibly powerful and useful tool. Um, and photographing physical beauty is, if you can catch the essence of that, or some sense of, of the place through photography, that's, that's, that's a very powerful tool. It's a good, it's, it's a strong weapon, but it's not the only thing. It's not the only thing that persuades people. Like for us or for me, it might be, you know, what really grabs me and engages me is seeing something gorgeous and knowing that it's, um, you know, threatened by inappropriate use or could be better protected. But other people, it might be the economics of situation, the fact that you know, logging has never been economic in Tasmania except for the private companies. Um, or it might be the, the social injustice that, um, you know, or whatever issue it is, um, different things will grab different people. Um, yeah. yeah, so I think that that's, that's pretty much it. Yeah. So what with fire, like to me, um, I mean, I was away for some of the more recent ones when they happened and I know Luke went out there and, and made a point of trying to document some of the impacts of the immediate fires as well. But I actually literally remember being under one of those dry lightning storms and just, I think I was down in Signet and it just arrived sort of out of the blue and I thought, isn't this unusual? There's all this lightning and there's, there's no rain. And then that same storm followed up Tasmania and I think there was 2,048 recorded lightning strikes and it started 75 fires that went for, you know, two months and, and started reaching into some incredibly delicate um, areas and areas that were burnt that, you know, as you were saying, haven't, haven't had the touch of fire for thousands of years. And a lot of those species 
don't have the, any capacity to adapt to fire. So once they're burnt, they're mm. essentially gone and they won't ever recover. Mm. And for people that didn't know, particularly in the alpine areas of Tasmania, 60% of the flora and fauna in, in alpine Tasmania is found nowhere else in the world, which is partly why, you know, 30% of the island is world, world heritage with such a high capacity um, because of that. And, and I, I know Rob and Luke have, have spent time engaging visually with, with the impact of fire and, and to me, the, the relevance of the Tarkine and, and such a, hard, a high volume of, of forest in particular being left intact is far more relevant now that we've lost a huge amount of the carbon storage in Australia this year um, and, and those massive, massive fires. And, and the, the likelihood of this continuation of a pattern is, is looking scarily. Um, um, well, it's just a scary, scary look down the barrel of what's coming, and, and it's such a shot across the bow for um, the impact of climate change that that we've sort of managed to avoid to some extent. But it's been such a literal in-your-face um, experience for so much of of the nation, and quite strangely, it's it's just been suffocated by this immediate shift into the COVID that I don't think we've collectively had the time to really assess and assimilate and and understand and 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 put in place practices or, or shifts in you know economics and 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 policy and 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 practice that will protect us from this in the future so i'd love to hear yeah your and luke's thoughts both about the the role of climate change and fire and and, and whenever it, when it suits rob it'll be lovely to see that body of work you were alluding to earlier yeah i mean i've just got a dozen I mean, they're all pretty grisly, so I'm not going to show too much, and I'll move to them pretty quickly. Um, oh, no, it's fine. Stay on it. Yeah, well, story. Um, but, you know, it is important to be engaged with, you know, the reality on the ground, and the reality on the ground is that so much of Tasmania is burnt. You know, we've lost so much in the last 200 years, inadvertently or and or deliberately, um, through fire. And in the future, even more than... The direct impact of logging or mining or whatever fire is the biggest threat to the integrity of the Tasmanian flora and its world heritage air and its non-world heritage air, its rainforests, its high alpine zones, which as Paul said there, um, many of them are completely un, um, unaccustomed to fire and are killed by fire, uh, or, you know, almost universally. So I'll show these few pictures. It's just a short slideshow so I'll share the screen again. So Rob I think for me even looking from afar when I saw those fires happen and and so much of them moved into these incredible heritage areas I think what I was struck by was that all the attention was on where a few batches were somewhere and and there wasn't so much inherent value in these places to protect them from fire they weren't seen almost as a valuable enough resource to to put energy into protecting as much that's yeah i mean it's carry into you know, later but, you know it's a bad question is what do we value you know exactly yeah and you know it's there's no two ways about the fact that we're in an extraordinary difficult situation because climate change has heightened as you said the fire threat and particularly through in tasmania through a dry lightning strike like prior to the year 2000 tasmania essentially did not experience dry lightning strikes i can remember bushwalking in the 80s um, in the Western Arthurs, and you know it happened repeatedly, but there was this one particular uh, time where we were sheltered under, you know, camped under this rock, and this cracking storm came through with lightning that you simply never ever experienced on the eastern side of Tasmania. But then, you know, a minute later, you just got absolutely drenched, like it just poured for and you know for the next two days, and there was no chance that a fire was going to get established. So it was, you know, that's just a, a normal thunderstorm. Um, I mean, that said, the fire that burnt out um, the eastern side of, of Mount Anne Massif um, was put out by snow, but it burnt, you know, it's a relatively small area that was burnt um, and it was a lightning and then, you know, the rain and the snow came. Um, and that was back in, I guess, the 60s or 70s. But what's happened now since the year 2000 and the dry lightning strikes have just increased. First of all, it was just a couple of year. And then now, like the, in 2016 and, 20, and last year, uh, we had, you know, as you said, Paul, thousands of dry lightning strikes, utterly unprecedented. And this is what, you know, the vegetation, the landscape is not, um, it has not evolved 
to be able to withstand this. And so we've incrementally lost um, parts of the you know, most important vegetation. And we've been here. I guess that's of- also sort of in Rob, that's probably one of the, the parts where some people that have a relationship with the Australian bush don't understand that the differences in the Tasmanian vegetation versus, um, you know, um, in, in on the mainland, for example, where you have a, a fire go through a eucalypt forest or something and it will just regenerate. And mm. some people think, well, you know, fire, um, it'll just regenerate and go back to normal in a few years. And, you know, that there's no major cause for alarm. Uh, and I guess that's a, a message that maybe um, it, you know, obviously doesn't fit in this situation. <laughs> Rob, yeah. do you want to put a picture up? Because we're just looking at the word fire. Well, oh, it's, it's we more pleasant to look at the word than the reality. So this is chronological. And again, it's only 10 or so slides. Um, pencil pines. So this is precisely the, the floor that we're talking about. These would have been, you know, each tree up to a couple of thousand years old, 1500 years old, ones of this size. This is in the walls of Jerusalem National Park. Um, Again, in the walls of Jerusalem, like this would have been the equivalent of Dixon's Kingdom. We now treasure Dixon's Kingdom as you know the finest and largest, and it's you know so magnificent um, in terms of its you know finest and largest king built oh, pencil pine forest remaining on Tassie and hence you know the planet and probably the universe. Um, but this was burnt back in the 60s, and it would have been deliberately burnt because at that time we had graziers wandering the central plateau. Uh, the late Pref, Prof Jackson from, from UTAS used to run field botany courses and I went on one soon after I came down to Tassie in the same summer when I first came down in 1980. And at one point he just sat down and started talking about conservation and it was just an eye-opener. He just talked for about two hours and I lapped up every word. And one of the things that he talked about was meeting these old trappers and graziers on the central plateau who just wandered around the whole summer with a, a mule or a horse or whatever laden with matches, just lighting up the country. And this loss here of a forest like this would have been a consequence of that. So this was deliberately lost. And this is another example of deliberate loss, um, you know, deliberate and direct loss. This was, this is Dunning's Rivulet. We used to call it Stunning's Dunning's because it was so, so beautiful. Um, this was burnt in about 1982 by a logger. Um, at the time of a forest festival at Jackie's March, which is just down the slopes. This is on the, the, the northern face of the Great Western Tears. And a logger was annoyed with what was happening in terms of you know, forest issues, forest conservation, forest battles in Tasmania. And as a result, just wandered up here and lit this fire. And it burnt out this whole extraordinary valley full of pencil pines, you know, classic. This is- um, oh, I didn't know that, Rob. Yeah, no, it's, it's an absolutely unknown tragedy of Tasmania. Like it's one of the biggest tragedies in you know recent decades, and it entirely passed unnoticed, um, apart from the people that you know knew the place or were directly involved in sort of watching it at the time. Um, this was a lightning strike, the Jane River fires. This is Algonquian Mountains, this is King Billy Pines again you know, whether it was climate change induced or not. So this is back in the late 80s, I guess, um, or mid, mid to late 80s. But, you know, it was a, it was a, a massive loss of this extraordinary King Billy Forest um, in a remote place. This is 2016 mm. on the Central Plateau. Um, that's Lake Mackenzie behind. Um, so this was a human in, human caused fire in that it came in the second half of January, at the end of the driest spring in Western and Central Tasmania on record. Um, and as a result of one of the, the lightning, the dry lightning storms that Paul was describing before. So this burnt, you know, through much of, or through significant areas of pencil pines and, and alpine areas around Lake Mackenzie, as well as in the Tarkine. So this would have been you know, clearly, you know, a year, a, a, a tree, you know, upwards of 2,000 years old. And you can see it's not only burnt the tree itself and, and killed it, but it's also burnt the soil because the soil here is organic. Um, and so all of these rocks, which are now exposed, the, the roots, you know, entwine with, um, would have been covered by peat soil before the fire. And so not only is the tree killed, but the soil is burnt because it's, you know, it's flammable peat. It's, you know, 100% organic matter, apart from where there's rocks. And so that makes re-establishment of, of trees um, 
into the, the fertile peat or into the peat, which is what they need to, you know, to retain moisture and so on, more difficult to get them to regenerate. The same location yeah. just north of Lake Mackenzie. And what's interesting here, like, is, um, you know, it's a tragic scene. And I think one has to acknowledge that. You can see through the centre of the image, um, there's a drainage line. It was a, it's, a, it's a creek. And you can see the dark, you know, relatively young pencil pines which, which track up through that creek. And it's quite likely that they're, in fact, all, at least most of those, were all the one tree. Um, because research, and it's ongoing research that people at UTAS are doing, are finding that there's extraordinary uh, clonal um, incidence of amongst the pencil pines. And so the, the roots um, form layers, and they might be, you know, half a metre under the soil or a metre under the soil, and there'll be, in, you know, different layers of different roots which are all belong to the same clonal clonal tree so and apparently they do that particularly in the water courses um, and so the what's lost here it looks young but it could be you know 5,000 year old formation you know absolutely fascinating stuff and we lose it you know before we have a chance to know how amazing it is this is where the fire ripped up this is um devil's gullet extraordinary place and over in the Tarkine, this is the rainforest, and particularly, you know, the ridges crowned by eucalypts, which burned in the Tarkine. But it's not only the ridges, like it's not only the eucs which are burning, because it is it is burning down in the valleys and it's burning the peat under the rainforest. Um, so that it... Right, so peat's quite famous for, for fires actually travelling underground and, mm -hmm. and reigniting a week later, because they've been slowly smouldering away. So they're quite brutally difficult to put out on the rob. Yeah, and I think I saw online somewhere just the other day that the fires that were burning last northern summer, like in Siberia and the Arctic, although covered by snow through, the, you know, the Arctic winter, have now in some places popped up and continued to burn. I mean, what an extraordinary thing. And the same principle, not quite as spectacular, but the same principle can apply in Tassie. And there was certainly talk at the end of 2016, if we don't get a good winter, you know, these fires will emerge again in spring. I don't think they did, but um, so not only in a, in a location like this, not only are the trees being killed outright, you know, from burning in the fire, the, rain, the myrtles and so on, but they can be also undermined. And so the soil burns and, you know, big craggy myrtle will simply fall over, topple over because there's no, the soil isn't there to support it. So this is um, 2019, the same, Luke and I did a flight earlier than this. And then I went back with Grant Dixon and did the second flight after the fires had finished. Um, this is the headwaters of the Huon River with the Western Arthurs behind. Again, you know, on the left there, it's, you know, obviously a country which has been burnt repeatedly. The fact that it's got no forests, it's, um, you know, the higher ground, the high ridges, the high exposed ridges. But every time it gets burnt, you know, what little vegetation that was there is burnt further. And then those gullies, that one to the left, you can see that's been burnt through. And, you know, it's the fire frequency that does the damage as much as, or as well as the intensity of the fire. And that fire was very intense. This is closer to Federation Peak. And you can see there, there's a little patch in the center of green forest and that's rainforest which survived, but all of the buffering vegetation has been burnt. And that, what comes back after it's been burnt is more flammable vegetation. So we've got this vicious, vicious cycle and vicious circle of um, increasing flammability of the landscape, fire, fire breeds fire. And this is the last couple of slides, the most concerning of all, because we're looking here at Mount Bobbs. Mount Bobbs is the Tasmanian and global and universal stronghold of the Kimberley Pine. And that fire burning up the western slope there burned into the Kimberley Pine, but then fortunately stopped. Like there was sufficient moisture in the forest, or the wind dropped, or the wind changed, or whatever, or nighttime came that it didn't, you know, it didn't rip up that slope, which it could have, you know, it's burning uphill and it's burning with the wind behind it, the prevailing wind behind it, but it didn't in 2019. Um, but it, it could next time. And it was a terrible gamble, going back to what you were talking about there, Paul, about that parks and forestry and, um, you know, the, the, the TAS Fire Service, the call that they made, because no resources were directed to this fire. At this, this was burning concurrently to the fires around Geaton and all the other fires across Tasmania. And so it was obviously, you know, a huge strain 
on resources. How do you direct resources where? But none came this direction. And it was a gamble because if it had been a little bit drier, the wind a little bit stronger, it would have ripped up that slope. And then over the hill, you're into um, you know, this fantastic, extraordinary, unique, un unparalleled King Billy Pine Forest, which if it had burnt, you know, would effectively you know, it, you know, have been lost forever. Mm -hmm. So these are, this is the dilemma that we're now in, in our climate change induced um, era. And again, going back, like it's, it's depressing stuff. Um, and how does one keep going in this situation? Like, I think, you know, we keep going because it's happening, you know, it's in front of us. What do we do? Do we just sit back and, and you know, ignore it, pretend it's not happening? Mm. That causes more internal grief, more internal pain than engaging with what is happening and doing whatever we can do, albeit however small or it may be, you know, serendipitous, serendipitously great what we can do as individuals, but, you know, we can do our best. And I think that that's um, all we can do. And it's like the horror of this sort of thing, you know, this seeing this grieves me so much. It's my, in terms of the natural world, this is my biggest nightmare, but it's also my biggest motivator because I, mm. we still have got enough left that is worth you know, giving whatever we can. You know, what are we here for on this planet? Not just have a nice time. Mm. You know, we're here, we can do, you know, all the good that we can for as long as we can in as many ways as we can. And I think that's, um, it, it, it's, it, it's, a, it's a invigorating thing as well. Like it's not, it's not, you know, it's not unpleasant. It's the opposite of unpleasant. It's, it's inspiring and it gets us out of bed in the morning. I guess there's a force that's um, pushing and the force that's pulling as well in that sense. There's the, um, the feeling of needing to, um, capture document these things um before ma they may be lost to to further fire or things like that and at the same time it's just the love of being out there um and and wanting to share it with people as well so um there's the it's a, like a a two-pronged uh, yeah. um, approach there yeah and they work together you know yeah. they're, like they're hand in glove the two things work really well and so it's um it's worth noting um a little bit of change in language and rhetoric and um, a lot of it unfortunately probably lip service but um, the, the the change in some of the messaging that was coming out from parks um, coming out from some politicians between the 2016 fires and the 2019 fires and there was um, quite a lot of emphasis on the natural places when talking in their briefings and how they were protecting them and et cetera, et cetera. And there was a lot of effort gone to, to protect certain bits and pieces, but it was an extraordinary fire event. Um, you know, I, I, the cynic in me says a lot of it was lip service, uh, but there was a, a huge, and that's from the, the bosses I'm talking about and the, the people in charge and trying to placate some of the outcry that there was from people like Rob and, and, and many other conservationists during the 2016 fires. Uh, so, that, yeah, there was a marked change um, in what they were saying. Um, they didn't have the resources um, to send to um, some of these places while things were burning close to uh, the towns in the Huon Valley, but it's also worth talking about here the role of forestry. Um, it's not just climate change and, and, and dry lightning. Um, the role of forestry, um, I've just published a report actually um, in Tasmania regarding um, the flammability of plantations and their role in making fires worse. Uh, and that's just been published in the last couple of weeks and it's um, quite an eye opener. Uh, but it was also quite obvious for most of us looking at the 2016 fires and then the 2019 fires and particularly seeing what happened behind uh, so when it came out of the button grass plains and into the area around where um, the well where the Tahoon Airwalk is, uh, a lot of people would know that as a tourist destination. It entered then plantations, and that's where it really, um, really uh, took off in areas that would otherwise ordinarily be wet 
uh, sclerophyll forests or wet rain forests, and they'd been logged and replaced by plantations. And the plantations with their monocultures are inherently dry. They don't have uh, the wet understory. They don't have the, um, the, the, you know, the wet um, uh, uh, soil uh, to, to suppress the fires. And so the, the showing those pictures, uh, Rob, of, of, of Mount Bob's, um, the wet rainforest, the wet uh, forest that, you know, that's never been logged in there, uh, it's, it's Southwest National Park, but that, that did its job in stopping the fires. And that's where the role of forestry we have to be so careful of because these plantations and the logging that's happening, they're happening on the edges of wilderness. They're happening on the transition between wilderness and suburbia and wilderness and rural land. And it's giving fire a path from one flammable area uh, through what is normally a non-flammable area uh, into another flammable area as, as such. Um, so with 2016, the Lake McKenzie fires, it's, um, I, I'm, I'm fairly sure that there are plantations, particularly around the Devil's Gullet area and in that valley, that precipitated the fire to move from the valley where the lightning strikes occurred and move up onto the, the plateau and burn the alpine vegetation because the buffer that ordinarily is wet and stops it just wasn't there. So it's part of the conversation and, and thanks so much for those pictures, Rob. And I note also um, Dan Brune, who's also watching this at the moment, I believe, he, um, he took some extraordinary pictures up there as well. And there's some, some great articles, particularly by uh, The Guardian, if I remember correctly, that have both Rob's um, images and Dan's images and they're worth seeking out um, just to have you know, a really good sense of, of or further sense uh, building on what Rob's pictures were. But um, there's, there's a really big story around climate change, around forestry and what it's doing to, to allow this fire to move into these areas. We lose the natural buffers. We don't have the resources to stop these fires. Um, so we have to look at winding back some of the practices so we can protect these areas. Yeah. Luke, some of yours got published too, I think, Luke. Where, so did you get yours in some of the ABC? Oh, uh, yeah. I, I had some um, with the Climate Council uh, and also the um, Tasmanian Archives have, have got some of the pictures as well. Um, so, yeah, there was a. I think um, then after that, too, uh, the Mercury also did a flight, I, I believe, and, and had another series of shots as well. So, um, yeah, it was it was good to, I guess, um, make people aware of the, the damage that actually had occurred because at that point, um, you know, there was only kind of reports and, and um, no one had actually kind of uh, been able to share what was like. And I think it help people from the mainland also understand, you know, the actual size and uh, the, you know, the, the, the scale of what was going on. Mm. The other, and again, I won't labour this point, but the other uh, impact of forestry as well as precisely what you've described there, Dick, that it creates like a young regen forest um, is essentially what's called, they call ladder fuel. It provides ladder fuels, that is, it provides um, you know, young tree will have branches all the way from the ground up to the canopy, be it, you know, 5, 10, 30 metres high. Whereas in old growth forest, there will generally be, a, you know, a space um, between the understory and, and the canopy. But with the ladder fuel forest, you know, the fire just whooshes straight in and the whole thing just goes up in one fell swoop. And the other aspect of forestry is that forestry is actually Tasmania's biggest emitter of carbon. Um, you know, we don't have a big coal industry here. We don't have a lot of emissions from big cities or industry or transport. Um, forestry, the logging of old growth or the logging of old forests is responsible for um, more emissions um, than any other sector in the Tasmanian, uh, you know, energy budget or you know, emissions budget. And there was a period of, um, in the early 2000s when in fact, Tasmania was um, logging more of the old forest than it is now. It's mainly re been reduced now for um, economic and markets reasons. But at that point in the mid, mid in the early um, 
in around 2005 and so on. The emissions that could be calculated from the areas burned in regen burns of all the logged coops in Tasmania came to about 7 million tonnes. And there'd been a study in 2001 that Forestry Tasmania had, had done, or someone in Forestry Tas had done, um, which documented and quantified the amount of emissions, like when an area is logged, and it's all just, if the logs have been taken off, the slash is there and they come along and burn it to promote eucalypt uh, regeneration. How much you can measure, you know, like measuring the amount of carbon material in a, in a certain plot and doing that around the coop before the fire and after the fire, you can you know, quite precisely measure how much has gone up in, in the fire itself. And, and that only, um, you know, the emissions um, equaled all of the other emissions in Tasmania combined, like it was an extraordinary figure of these emissions which go up in the region, burn smoke, you know, which is still occurring, which we still see every autumn. Um, it's, you know, it's, it's a portion of what it was at 7 million tonnes, but it's still, you know, a couple of million tonnes now. And that's a major contributor. You know, it's Tasmania's major, or major um, single contributor to, to greenhouse emissions. Um, there's, there's a comment um, here on the Zoom chat um, from um, uh, Tom Polichick. Um, excuse me if I haven't pronounced it correctly, Tom. Uh, he says there's a fairly destructive mining just to the east of the Tarkine, which would make quite a contrasting juxtaposition. Now, obviously, Tom's talking about in terms of photography and probably aerial photography, where we have this huge mine um, next to the Savage River National Park, which is a the um, uh, Savage River Mine run by Grange Resources. And it's it's been there for a very long time. Uh, but it, if you do look at it uh, on Google Maps, you'll, you'll notice just how huge it is. And I just wanted to make a note, because I, I didn't get a chance before when we were talking about uh, the Tarkine, uh, is that one of the one of the biggest hurdles for getting the, the extraordinary forests of the Tarkine, which are just as extraordinary, if not more extraordinary, than the rest of the forests that are already World Heritage protected in Tasmania. One of the big hurdles is that mining, because if you take a map, a geological map of Tasmania, and, and they are available, um, you'll see that the valuable um, uh, minerals and ore uh, generally in Tasmania is concentrated um, on the west coast, and that's where you know a lot of the gold mining and tin mining and iron ore mining um, uh, is. Uh, and a lot of the um, uh, the Tarkine has those underlying minerals. Um, there are areas south of the Tarkine, um, the West Coast Range, for example, which is extraordinary landscape, absolutely and utterly extraordinary uh, as well. Uh, with just beautiful fagus, which everyone would know, and, and, and just glaciated landscapes. In every sense, as beautiful as any other World Heritage area in Tasmania, but the hurdle is uh, these mining leases and, and, and this, these minerals, and, and the government wants to keep these areas as um, uh, open for, for mining, uh, and, and that's a, a huge hurdle. So it, it is worthwhile having a look into that and seeing what what we face and and, and seeing what you, you can you can uh, uh, bring from a photographic sense I, I, I really do think that um, there'd be some um, some extraordinary um, juxtapositions around that mine and other areas um, the strip mining up at um, uh, Nelson River with um, Shri minerals and and, uh, and and some of those other um, locations but Maybe it brings us in, Paul, to your um, video, uh, that your presentation. Yeah, yeah, maybe. Well, we talked a lot about juxtaposition. And I remember asking that question, Rob, earlier about, you know, where does beauty have a role? Where, do, where does, you know, I guess challenge or destruction have a role in terms of, you know, photography and conservation? And, and, and Rob very, um, very wisely answered that, there's no straight answer to that, you know, it's a dance and for certain audiences will engage with certain narratives and other audiences will engage with other narratives. And, and it's kind of like, do you, you know, the stick with a carrot is another kind of conversation in terms of which approach you're, you're coming from. So I'm part of a group called the light collective, and that's a, a group of some extremely talented Australian landscape photographers, uh, myself, Ignacio Palacios, Adam Williams, Ricardo de Cunha, who's on here tonight, and 
and Luke Austin and we originally got together, you know, to push ourselves as as image as landscape photographers and image makers to really grow and evolve as artists. And quite quickly we we recognized that there was a certain power to uh, having a collective, you know, there's a louder voice. The the sum is greater than the parts, you know, we have added skill sets, we have added visual uh, capacity, we have different ways of engaging with audience, you know, some of us could write well, some could speak well, some could handle technical sides, but my point being, and it's something I'd love to leave everyone with tonight, is engaging collectively is, is a wonderful thing to do, and it's, it's historically probably a fairly unusual thing to do in a way, from a landscape photographer's perspective, you know, when I started, I'd, I'd never heard anyone, didn't know anyone, and just everything by myself. And it wasn't actually until I met Rob and I became engaged with a nature photographer of Tasmania and, and we got uh, roped into doing some work with the Tasmanian Land Conservancy. We went out with, God, was it nine or 12 of us, Rob? I'm trying to remember, to the Vale of Beauvoir. Yeah, yeah. And all of a sudden I was out there with, you know, a, a lot of my great sort of heroes and, and we were all working collectively at the same time to, to work to empower and, and educate and create relationship and uh, with a place that not many people knew of and and that was my first taste of geez you don't you don't necessarily need to be doing this by yourself you know what is there to learn and not only did I enjoy it um, I was really inspired and I, I learned different techniques I learned to see differently um, and I felt like a part of something and by feeling a part of something not out your own you, you often feel more empowered um, you get to a point where you hit a brick wall or you've had enough or you get burnt out and someone will come and take your place. And, and it's like a leapfrog where that momentum can keep going. And uh, what we've done with our group is, is we've slowly transitioned where more and more our projects have become almost purely conservation based. And for our second project, we'd learned a lot more about understanding what we could do and what we could accomplish and what we could achieve together is we really started thinking about that. Our first project, we chose Lake Eyre, uh, which is a fairly mysterious, very remote sort of area of Australia. It's actually the lowest ebb of, of Australia. Everything drains to that point. You know, all the, all the river systems on the whole eastern seaboard of Australia basically drain into Lake Eyre. And when there's a flood in Queensland, it, it arrives in, in Lake Eyre three months later as it travels through all, all, the, um, all the rivers. And, you know, like it's, it's not an overtly a threatened place but it kind of is and that it's a very delicate fragile ecosystem and all the water table underneath is, is getting taken away by nearby minings and and the the mound springs that traditionally the the wildlife follows and and the aboriginal people you know follow for their own song lines are disappearing so it's it has its own fragility and sense of conservation but and so that was kind of our stepping stone into into that voice and as we've grown as a group we've realized we'll actually we're landscape photographers and let's not beat around the bush. You know, we've got, you know, as Rob said, we are the custodians of the world. There's no one else. The, it's too late to be putting our head in the sand and worrying about the generations down the track to, to picking up the pieces. It's the time is now, you know, the, the damage is so, the risk is so high. And so our second project, we chose the Great Barrier Reef. And the Great Barrier Reef to, to many is, is the, is a living embodiment of, of the beauty in the ocean. It's the largest living uh, structure on the planet. It's 2000 kilometers in breadth from north to south. It's visible from space and, and it's synonymously associated with, with, with beauty and magnificence. And it has been for decades and decades just held up to the world as, as one of the great natural features on, on this planet. And so when we decided to go up there and photograph it, we were like, well, it's at the moment, uh, it's half dead it's dying it's it's more than 50 percent gone you know and the chance of recovery is incredibly um, delicately held on the fact that the, the bleaching won't continue and the bleaching is caused by the rising sea temperatures which is essentially caused by global warming so and during covid actually um it's sort of slipped beside on the news but these bleaching events have have just absolutely almost quadrupled in size and it's under more threat than it ever has and it's looking like at this rate, it's going to be gone within 20 years. The largest living structure on the planet, just totally wiped out. And that's a, that's a stepping stone or, or, or a very visible um, and accessible global recognition of, of the impact of, 
of what we're facing as a planet down the future. Like it's so incredibly visible, you just can't ignore it. And, you know, as much as we're all kind of presenting a, a very conservation focused approach, I'm a bit of a realist as well. You know, I live in a wooden house and the wood's got to come from somewhere. And I drive a car that's made of metal and I've got a phone here that's full of all sorts of precious metals and it's got to come from somewhere. So, you know, I'm contributing in some ways to that demand. And that's where a lot of our choice comes from is where do we spend our money and what companies and what products do we support? has a huge economic influence you know and that's choices we can make individually but but going back to the reef it sort of felt like if we just went up there to photograph a few pretty areas of what's left of the reef are we really honoring the story of what's going on is is it almost felt morally and socially irresponsible to do that and that's been done before so how can we create a conversation how can we challenge people how can we ignite sort of more thought process around you know what's happening with the reef and and at the time we were up there there was this huge push and it's still happening to build one of the world's largest coal mines um, just inland from the reef uh, enough coal they want to ship you know 500 shipping containers through channels through the reef out to india to burn for cheap electricity um, which through most western nations has, has now been decided as one of the most destructive forms of electricity that exists on the planet and it's just it was just a little crazy really so we thought, you know what, let's let's take this on. And, and we changed the project from blue to black and blue. And we decided to include the storyline of the coal mining and, and, and its adjacent place, both visually, physically, economically, with the reef is that conversation because indirectly, at least, you know, that coal being burnt and going to the atmosphere is contributing to the global warming, which is rising the ocean's temperatures, which is killing the reef. So it's part of that cycle. So I guess, you know, we still want to paint a picture where we're using photographs and art more than more than politics. You know, we're not naming names, we're not pointing out places, we're not pointing any direct fingers, but we we decided to to put this really powerful juxtaposition side by side to get people deciding, you know, how do you weigh up? How do we find a balance between our growing energy resource needs uh, for this, you know, escalating um, planet population and the well-being of our great natural ecosystems and that's that's an ongoing question and probably one of the greatest questions of, of modern time uh, and that question is only become going to become even more sort of important and even more sort of relevant as as, as time goes on so quite luckily we had um, a great relationship with uh, ABC and they've come in and they've filmed a number of our projects and quite unusually they they gave us free reign in in terms of they produced a, a small um mini documentary here it's about six minutes that kind of let us say it exactly how it is they didn't filter it or or shape it somehow or or restrict parts of it they just let us really say it and um and again they've already put their hand up for our for our next project which is takana which um which luke's actually come on board with as well but i'll um i'll, I'll share my screen I can find the share screen button and let it speak for itself and we'll, we'll see what sort of conversation that uh, maybe ignites from here. Let's see, sharing your screen, give it a play. Give it a play. Well, we actually found literally a question mark, a reef in the shape of a question mark. And for me, I think it's, it, if you're going to pick a single image, we're asking questions. And as artists, we're great lovers of the natural world. We're all landscape photographers. We want to see the natural world thrive. It's a very important part of our well-being. And the reef is one of the most intricate and complex ecosystems in the world. We've uh, originally formed back in 2014, so almost five years now. And we're a collective of five, uh, and essentially we all decided to try and pull our resources to try and take on uh, larger scale projects that wouldn't be otherwise possible on our own.
you know, that was a beautiful collection of work, aesthetically beautiful. But as we've grown further and further, I guess we're looking for ways that we could use our art to maybe raise awareness or add value to some of the wilderness areas. And so we decided the Great Barrier Reef as the next project. But what we couldn't really wrap our heads around was how we were going to create a meaningful, purposeful body of work knowing that the reef was under tremendous threat. And what became really apparent is it almost felt socially and morally irresponsible to go up there and just photograph and exemplify the beauty of what's left of the Great Barrier Reef. It's 50% gone. It's the largest living structure on this planet and it's half gone. It's the biggest warning shot across the bow for global warming that exists on this planet. It took us a long time, but suddenly a, a light bulb so suddenly went off and we said, well, how about we highlight one of the main threats versus the aesthetic beauty of the Great Barrier Reef? And we decided to shoot the reef and then we travelled 300 kilometres west to the open cut coal mine seam and we shot what is aesthetically very beautiful images of a devastating beauty, if you like, of the open cut coal mines. Very abstract, very aesthetically beautiful. Um, and we put them side by side, the blue versus the black. Black versus blue, if you like, very suggestively titled the exhibition, Black, black and Blue. The rising sea temperatures around the world are what is taking the life away from the reef. And for all we know, whether you believe it or not, 97% of the world's scientists do, rising sea temperatures are caused by fossil fuels in particular. So addressing the coal mining industry, it's just as a symbol, not pointing fingers, but putting them side by side as a juxtaposition ask a lot of really important questions. Can we find a sustainable balance between our growing energy resource needs and the well-being of the world's great natural ecosystems? I was a full-time professional photographer, I, I was an engineer and I was actually a renewable energy engineer and uh, working in projects, uh, you know, building wind farms or solar farms, so I always want to give to the environment and that, that was my way of, uh, you know, giving to the environment and now working as a photographer, working in this kind of projects, um, you know, that's, uh, it's, it's another way of, of giving, yeah. It's not for everyone. Hanging out, hanging out of uh, fast-moving metal objects in the sky, literally on, on harnesses and leaning right out, sometimes in hundreds of kilometres an hour of wind flow, you need to have a very good understanding of how to handle it technically. And also, everything moves so quickly, your compositions change every second. So you sort of got your feelers out, your intuition's up really high, you, you're looking at colours and angles out of the corner of your eye. You know, where is there a shift in tone or transition? Where is there an emotive kind of corner that juxtaposes certain things? Where is a sense of emotion? Where is an alignment? Where is a graphical shape that's kind of come together? And often you don't literally take the exact composition you want. We use very high resolution cameras. So later we can sometimes even create one, two, three or four different images out of the same capture. I suppose they are aesthetically beautiful and we were aiming for that, but we were careful not to be, you know, too polarised one way or the other because I guess our main aim is, you know, the converted are already converted, so we want to sort of appeal to that borderline there that are undecided if climate change is really a bad thing or if it's just a made up thing or whether we need to do anything about it at all. We come back with six and a half thousand images, you've got a lot of room to explore and refine your story, your narrative and, and symbolism. So it allows not only your brain to, to engage with the work, but other parts of you being your emotive self and your symbolic self and your figurative self and, and a deeper sort of underlying subconscious even. So by not presenting everything just purely literal, by taking the horizons away, by creating quite abstract work, it leaves a lot of room to move and interpret and for people to engage and bring themselves into the conversation and bring themselves into the images and bring their own emotions and feelings in there, whatever they may be.
I, I hope you can actually see that properly. Um, as I said, Zoom is a bit of a sketchy platform for, for getting full quality video, but this, the story and I think the narrative in there is, is pretty appropriate for tonight. And, um, and it's, you know, it's an, it's been an inspiration to be part of that group and, and to aim forward and, and, uh, we've actually squarely aimed our next project to be on the Tarkine or Tarkina in the Northwest coast. And we've already begun and we've already done our first nine day, um, phase one of the project with a, with a filmmaker and, we invited um, Matt Palmer, who's the current uh, PP Australian Photographer of the Year uh, and Landscape Photographer of the Year, and also Luke Luke Sharkey to come on board as as guests because we just felt like, you know, having more voices for for that landscape and and that wider skill set and particularly people on the ground, and that Luke and Matt and I are here in Tasmania, whereas the rest of the light collective is further afield. You know, we can sort of really engage with it in a, in a more continuing sort of ongoing sort of basis. And, um, you know, a lot of my inspiration from, from targeting this landscape is, is, is come from, from Rob and from Chris Bell and his incredible book he's done there. And my friend Darvis who, uh, Walker, who started the first kind of ecotourism project where he tried to create and present a, a viable alternative for, from primary industry to, to tourism in that area and, and see if there's other ways we can, get the local community on board to transition in terms of what's possible because that's a big part of the politics of of protecting a place is, is where and how is the local economics and, and infrastructure and, and job relate to that particular landscape and, and Rob would know that strategy sort of well. Um, if you want to see it again properly jump on the Light Collective website thelightcollective.com.au and under the media section there's a whole section on, on um, the different sort of videos and projects we've done and, and that one will be there and you can watch that at your own leisure and a few others as well. We'll also add it as, uh, to your playlist on the Talking Landscape Photography channel as well, Paul, um, under um, Paul in other places on YouTube and you'll be able to find it there as well. Yeah, um, have you seen that one, Rob? I haven't seen that film, no. Any, any thoughts about how it sort of comes across? You can see that balance <laughs> we're having about where, you know, how do we relate to... Yeah. As, as Adam put it, you know, we, do we want to preach at the converter? Do we want to reach down the middle and try and engage with the, the central sort of um, part of our, our culture, which to me is probably potentially the part that might have the biggest tipping point in terms of, you know, making, making change actually happen. And also just getting it up on the ABC. It's fantastic. It actually um, probably goes to one of our questions that um, Alistair said, we said, um, Rob, thanks for your amazing work, amazing important work. Uh, I'm curious uh, how as a photographer you approach an environmental threat like climate change that is on such a massive scale and relatively slow moving as opposed to something concrete like a dam or a mine. And I suppose the way you were approaching it, Paul, with your, um, um, with your um, project Black and Blue is probably one of those ways. What, what do you think, Rob? Have you got um, your own thoughts on that? Well, I think climate change just underpins virtually every environmental issue that you know we now face. And I think the you know whereas 20, 30 years ago, if you're you know, engaging a logging you know, forestry campaign, it was to protect the beautiful place that was being logged. Now it's that plus um, this underpinning threat that um, you know logging old forests uh, presents, um, and you know that becomes more important as time goes by. And so, yeah, it's just added to the reasons. It's all, it's all integral. It's all, yeah, it's all mixed in, in there. Um, cutting down trees is bad for climate. Um, it's the long and the short of it. And if we can uh, keep uh, the old growth where it is, then we can keep the carbon where it should be. And that will help with um, climate change. So, there's a yeah. There's another approach. There's a black and blue project. There's a, a different one as well. I think there's many. Uh, like again, what I said at the beginning. Like we're all in different positions, all different capacities, different interests, different skills, blah blah blah, different resources. Um, and it's just a matter of that question: What can I do? What can I, as an individual, either as alone or you know in concert in the way that you are, Paul, there with your your gang? Um, I note that Tim Cooper's online here watching us um hey, to me such a champion and i just want to give a shout out to you tim because like for people that don't know tim cooper he's you know or relative to me a younger guy um and probably relative to most of us here a younger guy um 
but Tim, your heart is, you know, it's so apparent your heart is absolutely in the right place. Your dedication is right there. And it's just fantastic to see what you're doing because what you're doing, um, Tim spent a fair bit of time um, in the forest protest camps. And in the last, all I've, you know, it's just for me, I've, it's become visible to me in the last you know, month or two or prior to COVID, the last month or two prior to that, up through this last summer, Tim, you, you started climbing trees. So he's up there you know, ropes and harnesses, climbing trees up where the tree sitters are and, and the tree riggers are and getting these extraordinary sh shots which show these beautiful old, big old ukes, you know, a big trunk, you know, 30 metres above the ground with a couple of people, you know, sitting and having their lunch or yeah. um, rigging up a platform or whatever. So it, add, it shows like the courage, the commitment, the beauty of these people who are so passionate about a forest that they'll you know put themselves on the line um within the context of the place that they're trying to protect and tim you're you're catching it in a unique way that no one's done in tasmania before um, yeah well well done it's tim. Really good company you know, it's it's great and it's just as an example of what you know all of us will have a, a particular inspiration a particular bent that we can pursue which will have a positive impact you know greater or smaller left or right um, Heath, you're here also. Your, um, you know, your incredible photography with, you know, nighttime photography with, with, with devils. Um, you know, no one else is doing that. Yeah, <laughs> um, it's fantastic, and I think that's the take. You know, it's the ongoing message from a discussion like this, which is, you know, fundamentally depressing. But the ongoing, motivating aspect of it is that we can all do something. We've just got to find out what it is. And, crack get in there and you know do what we can do and at different periods of our lives it's going to be greater or less or different like i know when i had a young child you know you know for 10 you know, for five years you know i basically didn't do any activism at all it just wasn't within my capacity and then you know he's, he's now grown up um i've got a lot more time and you know our lives change we can throw ourselves into projects or not yeah. in different ways through our lives, through, throughout the course of our lives. Yeah, that's right. You've got um, um, uh, those different skill sets and, and I guess um, uh, documentary photography like what Tim's doing, and Tim's also a great observer of the landscape and, uh, and the, the detail as well. And, uh, uh, but the, the documentary photography is something that, that you know, you may not be so interested in, in, in landscapes, you might be more interested in portraiture uh, and, and documentary photography can, can show people enjoying themselves in the landscape or protecting the landscape um, as, as Tim has done. And, and, and people like Matthew Newton, he's probably the best exponent of it um, that this state has uh, in, in journalistic photography of uh, around these issues. And, 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 and he's got a lot of work out there that's worth seeking. Uh, or wildlife photography Heath, Heath Heath Holden absolutely beautiful work and it all comes back to um to, to the the power of sharing these photos and getting people to care about the wildlife getting people to care about the landscape getting people to care about those that are able to get out there and and be more active in their roles in, in protecting these places and it's just you know extraordinary to see but Maybe we'll go on to another question. Yeah, um, that. Nick, there was a great one that sort of is in a similar vein to that um, on YouTube, which was um, who is the audience for conservation photography and, and how do you reach the people that are unaware? Um, I guess that's talking to what platforms or, or how do you get the message out there or your imagery out there in front of the people that actually um, need to see it, I suppose. It's a, it's a tough question. It's, it can be a controversial one, and it, and it will come back to what I'm sure there may be some people out there screaming about, and also what's said here um, that Alistair also put, um, and, and, and Tom, uh, about um, the, Alistair about proposed developments around Dove Lake at Cradle Mountain, but, but Tom more generally, um, one of the dilemma, uh, dilemmas with all the inspiring landscape photography is the impetus they give to tourism and to turning these landscapes into um, uh, quotation theme parks, uh, how, to, how to keep them from being loved to death. And that's the big question that we all face. How do we 
share these photos and these places in a responsible manner? And how do we deal with the fact that us as photographers is also, um, are also encouraging people to come to these places because they're so beautiful? It's a question I've asked several times in similar forums, and you always um, it always gets a, a lively answer depending on who's answering it. But um, Rob, maybe you you can start us with this. How how do we how do we do this responsibly uh, in terms of not yeah, just going back a couple of questions there, you know, how do we pitch uh, a photographic work or other work to reach an audience that, that needs to be reached? And we just do it in the best way we can. We do it, you know, in a big um, frame if we can, or else just on a small local frame. And again, going back to what I said at the beginning, even if one goes to the Tarkine, doesn't take a picture, just when he goes to the edge, looks in and says, wow, that's amazing. Goes back and tell your neighbours, you know, this is all good stuff, it's building the identity of, in this case, the Tarkine as, as a beautiful natural area. And what you've told your neighbour will be reinforced if they happen to see a picture from somebody who's, you know, embedded themselves on a month long trip in the middle of the rainforest. Um, I think that that question that you talk about there, Nick, um, photographers can have a negative impact also by concentrating visitation to a particular site which is really spectacular and I think there's a couple of ways to look at that one is like a simple way to reduce that is not necessarily to to name and locate the place where you've taken the picture like if you go to you know obviously you've got a cradle mountain everyone knows it's cradle mountain um, but if you've gone if you've found um, you know the relatively early point in its sort of exposure, a place which is just really stunning. Sure, go and take pictures and enjoy it and, you know, portray that place, but you don't have to say where it is. And that immediately cuts out a huge, like for someone who's really, really intent on finding out, you know, they can probably work out with maps and, and looking at vegetation or landform where, where it might be, and they might go and find it themselves. But A, it won't just give an easy path for everyone to go there and be for those people that really do want to get there. That's great. You know, they'll really have to exercise their imagination and, and, and work to, to locate that place. Um, it's a different story if you're in the Tarkine, say, because I think that an area that does need exposure. Um, so any picture that I you know take in the Tarkine, I'll say where it is. Like I won't necessarily say precisely where it is, but I'll absolutely say this is the Tarkine and that invites a, it doesn't necessarily, you know, pinpoint locate where the place is, but it invites interest, heightens the identity of the Tarkine and invites someone to go and explore it further. If I go to somewhere in the southwest, which is in the middle, middle of a national park, I'm not necessarily going to say this is, you know, Moraine X on the Western Arthur Range or, you know, that little area just north of Federation Peak that no one ever goes to. You have to go down this really steep gully and get there and it's really fragile, but, you know, you know I'm not going to say that. And so that's mm -hmm. one choice. I think the other thing, um, there are different levels of engagement in environmental conservation issues. And I think, you know, the, the primary tier, the most important tier now is, is you know, this overarching climate change, how it impacts everything. And below that might be a specific, you know, wonderful forest, which is owned for logging or whatever. And then to my mind, at least further down from that comes the impact of loving a place to death. Like I'd rather see a place loved to death than you know, the whole place clear felled or turned into an open cut mine or lost in a, a human caused wildfire. That is not to say that, you know, you know, what's happening in Dove Lake, for instance, I think it's just an inappropriate, it's very poorly envisaged architecture. And I, you know, it appalls me, but I'm not going to, that's, you know, for some people, it may be the issue that they really engage with. Um, but I think there are, you know, we do need to prioritise um, where we put our energies. Not to say that people shouldn't engage with, you know, an issue that concerns them, but it probably is worth thinking about what the hierarchies are of importance at this point in time. Mm. There, I mean, there are a million, there are a million answers to the question, and, and uh, going back to to sharing with an audience, uh, there's um, uh, the much maligned popular photographer on Instagram or, or, or some other platform that, that has you know, many thousands of followers um, uh, that 
uh, tends to attract attention, for example. Um, you know, they're sharing a conservation message quite often. Um, not, not all, obviously, Instagram's a very diverse range of people, but, but um, there are lots of, there are a number of people I know, and, and, and Luke would be one of them, of course, uh, that have a strong following, but also have a good message. And it's by, um, uh, it's, it's that balance, I guess, Luke, you can probably talk a bit more about it. It's a, it's a delicate subject, but it, it's a balance about um, giving that, giving a certain message and, 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 and keeping your audience as well um, without overpowering them with, 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 with certain things. Um, what, what are your thoughts? So you probably... Oh, no, it's certainly. A, if, if if there's a topic that I've um, deliberated over um, for hours and hours on end, it's definitely this topic. Uh, and um, I guess we're all human, and we all um, we all um, have our own kind of um, uh, approaches to how we we uh, address this. But I think that the main the main thing is that um, everyone does have an influence, even if they feel like they don't have much of a following at all. Uh, everyone has the capability to influence other people's behaviour. And so if you've got a big following, then obviously um, it's really important that you uh, make sure that your messaging that goes along with the imagery is um, promoting responsible, um, uh, you know, act activities in, in, the na in nature, I suppose, or you know, when encouraging people when they visit these places to, to have respect and, and um, not necessarily, like Rob was saying, give away uh, where a, a remote location may be um, because there's, there's no need for that, really. Um, people can still um, appreciate a photograph not knowing where the photograph was taken. So I think um, that in, in certain landscape photography circles, there has been a bit of um, stigma with, you know, you know, people need to be able to share location because, you know, that's, that's everyone's right to know, which is, is just total rubbish if anyone's ever been um, subjected to, to that kind of criticism. Yep. But um, I think, you know, um, yeah, we all have our own um, unique message that we can provide. And it's very important that um, the messaging that we put around our imagery um, really respects the environment uh, where the, these images were taken and that the viewer can actually understand that as well. So you don't have to necessarily be kind of evangelical about it. Um, you can just um, help people to really appreciate the beauty of the place and understand that um, you know it's either protected because a lot of people put a lot of time in, and effort into getting it into that state, or um, it's not protected, and and we we really need to do more to make sure that that these places um, stay with us. So um, I don't know if that fully answered the question, but I mean it's it's definitely a, a I mean it's probably worthy of its own episode, really, uh, in terms yeah. Yeah. Of, um, how much materials there. <laughs> It's, it's, it's a big topic. And I think the main thing that we all have to remember and harks back to what Rob said initially and what I sort of uh, alluded to as well, that we, we've all got our own individual contributions to make to this. They might be extraordinarily large and, and you know, important in the scheme of things. They might be smaller. They might be something we can do with a large audience. They might be something we can do with a small audience. But we all have our own constraints. We all have our own uh, personal situations where we we know where our boundaries are and we can do uh, what we can do. And I know personally, I I have some really quite strange boundaries uh, that at times I push a bit, uh, but they're boundaries that I can't go past. And I know Luke will have his boundaries that he can't go past, but he's making extraordinary contribution in other ways. Um, there are other people that, that aren't that constrained at all and can say and do what they wish um, and, and, and will put things forward. And I, I think it's really important to remember that we, our own contributions are personal and there are reasons why we do and don't do things. Um, but we think deeply and care deeply about what we do say, what we do do. And it can be difficult to be criticised at times for things we think are within our boundaries. Um, 
and yeah, it's a criticism's it, it, important too. I think as yeah, well. It's, it's, it's um, it, it is tough to take things on the chin um when when that happens, but at the same time, it does get you to think. And and um, you know, I, I do value that um personally when that happens because um, it's important to to be able to self reflect and, and reevaluate your approach to things as well. It's now half past nine. Yes. Yeah, Rob. I was just going to say, like, at the end of the show, Rob and I talked about it beforehand that maybe finishing on, um, and you might be going a different direction, Rob. So forgive me if I'm jumping a gun. But I was just going to say, relate. It's sort of it's what you said next, but it's just two two very short stories, and then can I do that, and then I'll let you go. Oh, great. Here we go. Please. So they were both around the Franklin campaign, and it was it's more it's sort of about uh, what's in our control and what's not in our control. So, like, I think it's really, really, really important that, you know, in whatever way we can, we push in the right direction. We have to do absolutely everything we can. We have to strategize, be smart, be creative, be intuitive, everything like that. We just have to push in the right direction. But things happen. And there are two instances of this that happened through the Franklin campaign. And the first was, um, well, the blockade. Um, we planned for a year and a half, you know, just so much work, you know, working 18 hour days, this small bunch of young, unemployed, idealistic people um, leading up the Franklin blockade. And finally, the day dawned, 14th of, 12th or 14th of, of um, December. And it was in Strawn, you know, in, in late spring on the west coast. Um, you know, the weather could have been anything and, and it, more likely than not, it would have been everything, you know, just normal west coast weather, but it wasn't. It, it dawned this most glorious, blue, calm, perfect day on the Gordon River. And all the media was up there, you know, cruised up nicely on this placid um, Macquarie Harbour across the Gordon River. And there were the protesters all with their banners and so on, it, and, and the rainforest. It showcased this extraordinary rainforest in the most, ex in the most fantastic way. And the next day was, was terrible weather, and the day before it had been terrible weather. You know, things happen. And the other instance of that was, um, Prior, to, I think in the year or so before that, there'd been a Tasmanian film called Manganini, which was about a Tasmanian Aboriginal person, been made by the Tas Film Corporation. And as a short to that, somebody had made, and I can't remember which one it was, a, a very short Franklin River film. And at the prem, the you know Tasmanian premiere of Manganini, the um, it was in the Odeon, the old Odeon Theatre, and it was full capacity with all of the establishment of, of Tasmania, so all the politicians, and including the Premier Doug Lowe. And so they showed this, you know, five minute short film about the Franklin River, and then Manganini was going to come on. And just before Manganini came on, this guy, um, who was basically a, because well, I'm not naming him, I can say he was basically a real weirdo. <laughs> um, he was a completely out there hippie. And he, he just stood up and yelled out, save the Franklin in, in, the, in this very dignified formal establishment setting. And everyone started clapping. And apparently that was one of the key things that changed Doug Lowe's mind about this extraordinary emotion that you know, swept through the whole Odeon audience. And Doug Lowe was sitting there in the midst of it. And that was really what shifted him to a no dance or you know, a compromise dance. And hence, you know, the dominoes fell to an ultimate outcome of no dams. So things happen. And you know, if it hadn't been for that, <laughs> that you know, hippie, um, you know, I can't quite think of the right word, but you know, a guy who is totally out there standing up and, and yelling out this totally inappropriate thing, but that just catalyzed this sequence of events, which you know, was instrumental in the final outcome. You know, who could have planned for that? Wow. <laughs> that was a great story, Rob. <laughs> So Rob, I, I, um, I remember we, we spoke about it earlier that it might be nice to maybe, I guess, finish this episode with, and we have touched on already to some extent, but I guess maybe the accessibility of what people can do, um, even starting from a small way. So people feel like they're, um, I'll maybe start with a few cents from myself and, and maybe Luke or Nick or Rob could, could follow up like, I feel like, cause I, I've, I've got to a stage where I've, I've been around these really fiercely active people. And sometimes I feel guilty that I'm not out on the front line, you know, putting everything on the line, so to speak. But also I feel like it's not quite my way. 
And also there's at times I felt like it's a bit overwhelming. How do you take on global warming and, you know, the, the, the capitalism and, and the economic system, it's just all too much. But I think the way I personally felt more empowered is by coming back to, well, what can I do today? Well, actually, I'm going to ride my bike into town instead of drive my car. Or like, actually, I don't need those lights on. Or um, I'm planning this trip. Maybe I can carpool with someone instead of going on my own. Or, um, well, you know what? I'm going to pay a lot more attention to what I'm buying. What is this company's product that says, have they got green practices? Do they recycle? Or, um, you know, you know, there's, you know, do I need to use that much water or, or can I, you know, wait next day for the washing? It, irrelevant of, of photography. And even though that's another sort of more overt mechanism, there's so much we can all do on a very, very simple basis. You imagine if, if everyone in the world spent a day just thinking like that, I think the energy resources of the world would, would drop noticeably. It's sort of like, um, it, it's it, when it's too much to take on something so large, how do we slow it down? You know, can you, can you just pull together a slideshow for your local photography club that maybe inspires some people to maybe come together collectively? You know, could, could you share a few extra videos online of, of really, you know, uh, passionate speakers or educated people that explore some of the issues at hand? So, so that's just fresh in people's minds, you know? Can you bring it up in conversation around the dinner table with people? Can you, um, you know, take some of your neighbor's kids out to a beautiful place that haven't been there before. So they can start appreciating and building a relationship with, with country that they otherwise probably haven't engaged with. Like it doesn't have to be this overwhelming thing, you know, it could be just yelling out in the theater, you know, just, just one word. It's such a great story of just, you know, cause I think it's really important that we don't feel so overwhelmed that we're overwhelmed into inaction. And I think starting small and on, on a daily sort of basis is, is kind of my my ten cents about how to maybe leave tonight and and you know I've, I've the confidence I get of thinking bigger has for me has come collectively from being in groups like the Nature Photographers of Tasmania and and connecting with other organisations like the Bob Brown Foundation being a part of a incredible project like Tarquin in Motion which if you haven't heard of is one of the largest sort of um, conservation based projects with artists in the country where we were specifically targeted the Tarkine and we invited 150 artists from all around Australia to come in just to build relationship with place and share it with everyone around the world through song, through voice, through painting, through sculpture, through, through jewelry and through a real great positivity and celebration of, of land, you know, like, uh, and Dan Brown here was been on here tonight. He was a, he was a mastermind behind that one and I've been to all of them. Um, it was a bit sad not to be going there. There's an online version of that happening to some extent um, next month, which I'm a part of. But yeah, I guess it's, um, you know, it, there's no time but the present. And, uh, you know, as, as the world starts opening up and we, we're allowed to start moving out a little bit more into the world and, and being more active with our, with our cameras and, and our videos. Rob's sort of got me thinking about video a lot more after tonight, to be honest. Um, you know, where, where have you got time and space and energy to contribute to making the world a better place? It's done a lot for us and uh, nobody's going to look after it if we don't. <laughs> so that's, that's probably me. I just, sorry, I just felt moved to share in that regard. And I thought it'd be a nice way to maybe wrap things up tonight is anyone who wants to share, um, uh, you know, an empowering kind of accessible ways to, to move forward, engage from here. And um, such a privilege to have Rob here. He's, he's definitely one of my great heroes and, I don't, I don't put too many people on pedestals. It's not really how I do things, but it's been wonderful to walk alongside him and to be his neighbor up the road and, and to be inspired by his work for decades. And um, real privilege to have you here, Rob. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And he, he even turned down a night shooting. He rang me up two days ago and said, oh, the night sky is going to be amazing. I'm doing this other sort of project that's going to be fantastic and perfect. And how do you <laughs> feel I'm sitting there doing on my laptop, doing this sort of out on a beach somewhere up the East Coast? And I'm like, what? How do you how do you tell one of your heroes to not go and shoot? <laughs> like, I don't know if that's going to work, Rob, but there's not like, that much reception out there. And, and good old Rob, he, uh, he stopped himself, but he's transferred it to tomorrow night. So um, thanks for that. Yeah, Nature, good on you, Rob. Nature Cooperated. Yeah, um, yeah I'd just um, um, like to, to thank Rob as well. Uh, you know how much I admire you, Rob, and, and, and you've given me opportunities and guidance over the years, so thank you very much. Um, and I also wanted to just say 
Um, I think education is really important, um, educating yourself, um, knowing what that plant is that you walk past every day, knowing uh, how flammable it is, will it regenerate if there's a bushfire, um, knowing um, uh, what's special about a place culturally to the Indigenous people, knowing um, what uh, politicians are up to, um, who what their beliefs are, knowing what they're doing about climate change, knowing what they're not doing about climate change. Just always read, always just keep yourself educated, and and then you know you can you can help pass some of that knowledge on to someone else. And I think that's um, you know even without a camera in your hand, um, that's something that we can all do um, and lose some of um, the unfortunate ignorance that's out there. Uh, it really isn't that hard to um, to separate fact from fiction if you if you're careful with how you uh, seek your education and knowledge and um, and yeah just learn a bit more about the things around you and, and 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 share some photos of it and I think that's a good step in the right direction. Yeah, that's fantastic, Nick. I I totally agree. I think it's great to. Um, be able to reinterpret the landscape um, that you're sharing uh, in your photos um, for the people that are actually viewing it. And then they can also learn from seeing your work. And I think that's very powerful because you're, you're becoming an educator uh, in your own right. Obviously you need to be very sure the information you're providing is true and correct, but um, it, 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 that's a pretty uh, amazing place to be. So um, yeah, thank you very much, Rob, for joining us. Um, and um, Oz, did you have another video as well? Yeah, time's getting on though. People... Yeah, well, I thought that might be a good way to lead us out, maybe with that. Oh, um... Okay, people can. We've got plenty of people online. Want... Yeah, <laughs> I'll go if they don't want to stay. So... <laughs> it's only four or five. It's only four and a half minutes. That's our like. show. It's our rules. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so let me just go straight to that. I mean, the only final word. It's sunny here, is, Luke. Um, yeah, I think it's really important we all just follow our passion because, mm -hmm. like, although we're faced with this dire situation it's a very joyful process to do to throw ourselves into you know confronting what is before us that we can't avoid you know it's there in front of us and we need to learn we need to you know be dedicated um it's very stimulating i mean what, what an era that we live in to be at this point in time we've all got to really rise to the occasion and that's that's very exciting as well as scary anyway um so the last it sort of relates back to what's well, a it's an audio visual on um, Gondwana. So the second project that I mentioned before is about Tasmania's beautiful endemic Gondwanan flora. This is four minutes long, and it's an AV set to some nice music, um, and it just celebrates that beautiful Tasmanian flora. So let me get it going. So Rob, you've got some scientists involved doing some of the, the speaking overview. I, I, was, I was trying to get a sense of who the people were that were you know, speaking to their knowledge about country. Yeah, so basically it's been, well, it's been extended for a year because of the COVID situation, because um, I wasn't able to get out to um, get photos of the Fagus, which is a deciduous beach resort, obviously is a central feature in a visual representation of Gondwana in Tasmania. Um, but basically, like it's a work in progress. Uh, people from the uni, Greg Jordan, Dave Bowman, people like that, um, will have input. Um, but essentially, like the Tasmanian Gondwana, you know, it's becoming more known. And to bushwalkers, it's a well known thing. You know, everyone goes out photographing or just visiting the Fagus in autumn and so on. But outside of you know, that sort of Tasmanian network, it's not really understood and the antiquity of it is not appreciated to the degree that it should be. And hence it doesn't get the resources that may be required if a fire comes along or whatever. So the idea of the Gondwana project, which we're doing through Wild Island, which is sort of a, a shop and gallery and an events center down at Salamanca and Hobart is to create this, this video. So this is just a, as I said, it's an AV as opposed to a video um, on Gondwana. Share screen.
Well, that was pretty wonderful. <laughs> Thanks, Rob. Yeah, it's pretty motivating stuff, isn't it? Oh, it is. I've, I've been looking at that image of Rapid River for I don't know how many years, Rob. <laughs> yeah. As, as a source of inspiration and for those of you that don't know i mean i when i met rob he was in the middle of his um large format transparency was kind of the main medium he's using and and if you could have any understanding of the the quality and caliber of, of an image you can you can get from from a, a tool like that in the hands of a master it's it's even today i don't think it's even equaled yet um so uh so seeing rob's work on a on a pixelated screen as, as like all of us know it's not doing it justice but i just sort of remind everyone anyway um that rob's yeah capacity and and i've seen so much of rob's work at a, at a huge scale and um yeah the quality from edge to edge corner to corner that he can produce through through his technique and, and his vision is just like few people i've seen in the world um hats off to you my friend if i have one <laughs> Yeah, if there was any doubt, if there was any doubt about I think it's why wrap this up, isn't it, Nick? <laughs> oh, no, man. but but if there was any doubt as to why we hold you in such high regard, Rob, I think that doubt has uh, quickly definitely passed out time. <laughs> Thank you so much. That that series of the same tree in all four seasons, or that same well, patch. The, the funny thing is that, is that um, the the spring and the winter on the same trip so it was a mid-november trip <laughs> <laughs> uh, well you got two for the price of one well done mate i probably need to wrap it up eh, luke that's, no, that's... We, we certainly do um so look thank you so much um again for joining us rob um and sharing those amazing videos and now is it will we be able to pass on um where that people may be able to see them in a bit higher resolution as well uh, they're on vimeo yeah uh, okay um yeah, I think they're both on. I'll make sure that AV's on as well. But yep. A couple of others, yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, no, so the, there's always a way to see it in, in the unpixelated version, which would be quite nice. Yeah. Um, and um, we're also going to play um, another video as well um, once we stop the YouTube feed. So for those that are on Zoom now, if you wanted to hang on when uh, after we stop the YouTube feed, then you can check that one out as well. Otherwise... Yeah. Um, that's a that's a world that's a world first. <laughs> it's uh, all all uh, hats off to our very dear friend Andrew Phipps and his incredible filmmaking. He um, it's the first taste uh, film of of the Light Collector's next project into Takana, and uh, it's still it's still in process. So we thought rather than record it and have it out there forever, we'd um we'd just wait till we switched off. And and for those hardcore fans, we'd uh, we'd give you a first feature. Yeah, if you've stuck around this long, then you certainly deserve that. So thanks so much. Um, so, all right. So um, look, thanks for joining us on YouTube. And um, next week we're actually on at um, on Wednesday. We're back to Wednesday again. It was only Thursday just for this week only. So make sure you tune in on Wednesday at 7.30 and we'll be announcing uh, what's happening next week um, very shortly online. So keep an eye out for that. Um, and all right. So good night, YouTube. Thank